Hallo? Ja. Uh, dear all, welcome to the opening of the CSAR exhibit at Akiva Peace and Human Rights Center in Kristiansand, Norway. My name is Sulve Hessus Winto and I work as an academic coordinator for inclusion and diversity at Akiva. And I will guide you through this opening. Uh, we are first and foremost grateful to the Syrian Emergency Task Force for lending us this exhibition and also to the talented participants in the upcoming panel that are joining us from all over the world. And also I want to thank Platform that is collaborating with Akiva on this. So together we are able to shed a light on the ongoing atrocities happening in Syria, framed within the context of Arkivit's own dark history that took place in this very building during the Second World War. Because on the 28th of January, 1942, the German secret state police took over the state archive, which today is Arkiva, which then became Gestapo's regional headquarters in the south of Norway. This lasted until the German capitulation in May 1945. During these years, Arkiva became a symbol of human contempt and torture. Over 3,500 people from all over the region were brought for questioning under suspicion of being involved with the resistance. At least 311 of the detainees were subjected to severe systematic torture. So because of this, Akiva was soon to be known as Norway's most notorious place for physical and psychological torture, hence referred to as the House of Horror. Today, Akiva has become a memorial site that serves as an education, research and documentation center. Akiva has specialized in using personal stories from the Second World War to contextualize the work we do in educating and disseminating knowledge about democratic values and inclusion, and also prevention of xenophobia and extremism. We believe the stories are an important source of understanding how the past has shaped our present and how it affects the society. By allowing people to tell their own stories, we gain new perspectives on an already written history. So the Caesar exhibit is placed downstairs in Archivist's original torture chamber. And this is done in order to make people realize that the violence and torture brought upon people living in Norway in this area during the Second World War is happening right now in Syria as I'm speaking. So with that, um, it's time to continue to go more into depth of the Caesar story and also the importance of his photos. So for this, we're honored to have with us, uh, both physically and digitally, uh, an outstanding panel, which you will meet very soon. Uh, but first, let me introduce you to our knowledgeable moderator for the evening, conflict researcher and international lawyer, Cecilia Hellestedt. Thank you. Okay. Um, now you can hear me, I hope. Um, now I am a Norwegian academic, a conflict researcher, and an international lawyer with a long history of working with armed conflict in the Middle East and specifically the Syrian war. Uh, I have the honor and pleasure of moderating this conversation with a very distinguished panel of guests. Uh, and due to the pandemic, most of the panelists are preventing from joining us here. Uh, on the positive side, it's a truly global conversation with participants from Trinidad, Germany, and the US. And one is here in Christiansand with us, 
and that is Omar al shoghra He's a Syrian. Uh, he's a surviving former detainee of the Sidnaya prison and a witness to the atrocities uh, in Syrian detention centers, documented by the exhibition. Thank you. Um, Omar was arrested repeatedly due to his participation in the uh, demonstrations against the Syrian regime from the age of 15, starting in 2011. And in 2012, he was arrested and kept in detention for three years. And the last year he spent in the Sidnaya prison. Now, Muaz, Mustafa, can you hear us? Yes, yes, I can. I was trying to turn on my well, video, but I don't think welcome. it's working. Are we going to see him up at the screen? It would be very nice to see you. Hello. Can you see us? I, unfortunately, I don't see anyone. And I'm, when I click to turn on the camera, it doesn't allow me. But I can hear you perfectly. So you are excluded, basically. But we can hear, hear you perfectly. So a very warm okay. welcome to you. Now, Moaz Mustafa, he is a Syrian activist as well. Uh, he's been living in the US for many years. And uh, he is the executive director uh, for the Syrian Emergency Task Force. And uh, let's say the director uh, who has been lending the Caesar exhibition to our Kira. And then we are joined by Ambassador Stephen Rapp. Uh, he is uh, jo joining us from Germany, I understand. He is an American lawyer and a true specialist in international criminal justice and international criminal law. Uh, he is the former US ambassador at large for war crimes issues uh, in the Office of Global Criminal Justice. Uh, he is currently a distinguished fellow at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum Center for Prevention of Genocide and at the Hague Institute for Global Justice. Now, Stephen Rapp has been instrumental in bringing forward the Caesar file, and he has also served as an advisor to the Commission for International Justice and Accountability, working to bring uh, justice to the Syrian victims. And then, finally, we have Sareta Ashraf. Uh, can you hear us as well? Welcome, Sareta. She's joining us from her home country in Trinidad. Uh, Sareta Ashraf is a UK barrister specialized in international criminal and humanitarian law. She's a senior legal consultant to the Simon Shedd Center as well for the prevention of genocide at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. And from May uh, 2012 to 2016, she served as the chief legal analyst uh, on the UN Commission of Inquiry for Syria, the UN Commission that was uh, gathering evidence about international crimes committed in the Syrian war. Uh, so a very warm welcome to all of you. Now we have about an hour. We are going to have uh, three sessions. Uh, and then finally, we will have a round of questions from the audience uh, at the end. Now. Uh, I'm going to give the word to each one, one of you uh, consecutively. Uh, and the first round, I would very much like you to present uh, the Caesar exhibition from your perspective. Now, I can hardly think of a better venue in Norway for the Caesar exhibition than Akiva uh, Peace and Human Rights Center, as this was, it used to be the local Sednaya prison uh, in southern Norway during the Second World War. Now, the Norwegian public, uh, is quite familiar with the essentials uh, of the Syrian conflict and the atrocities being committed uh, there. But I, I do invite all the four of you to reflect, to, to present uh, the Caesar exhibition and to reflect on the content and present it uh, to the public. What it is, what it, how it came about, and what it says about the situation in Syria. So I would like to start with you, Moaz. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. And I want to, first of all, thank you for, for moderating this. And thanks to Archiva for having this very powerful and important exhibit. And I cannot think um, of, of a more sort of solemn place that, that we can put this. Because um, you know we at the Syrian Emergency Task Force have been very proud to be public partners with the US Holocaust Memorial Museum since 2014, working on, on Syria in general. but but with a lot of attention paid to the Caesar file and what it is and the detention system there. And it's powerful to see parallels that exist between 
the never again moments um, that has happened in the past and then looking today and seeing that one is unfolding as, as we're all here. And it's such an honor to be on a panel with Sarita and with Ambassador Rapp um, and with Omar, uh, all amazing individuals that, that have done so much in the pursuit of accountability and justice and an end to the killing in Syria. And I think what I'd like to do um, in terms of the Caesar exhibit is explain sort of why we're all able to be here, why we at the Syrian University Task Force have been able to have a Caesar exhibit that's been around different parliaments and universities and museums across the world. It's because of an amazing individual codenamed Caesar. Um, it's not his, his real name, but protection was the name that was chosen. And Caesar is an incredible human being because he, I think, inspires hopefully all of us in the world to to know that that each individual can can do something um to uh to right the wrongs that unfortunately are are unfolding in our world still today caesar is an ordinary man who was put in extraordinary circumstances and through his courage um and and um you know his goodness uh he was able to bring out the most powerful evidence that's now key to multiple prosecutions and to accountability efforts and to transitional justice and also to give closure and, and information to the families of the hundreds of thousands of missing and serious prisoners. Um, and Caesar is, uh, was someone who was a military photographer, forensic uh, photographer for the military police uh, in Syria. He had served in the regime's military for quite a few years. Uh, this is well before the revolution. And his job was to go and take photographs of accidents and incidents that happen under the auspices of the Ministry of Defense in Damascus. And so there was a drowning, a drowning or a fire or a car wreck or a suicide uh, or any sort of accident, Caesar would go and take photographs um, of the scene um, and submit them alongside a report to the military court system in Syria. But in March of 2011, uh, and as some may know, uh, uh, when, when little kids, young kids, inspired nonviolent, multi-confessional, peaceful protests across the country, starting in Dara in southern Syria, Caesar was asked to go to document 15 instances of death that happened under the auspices of the security apparatus in Damascus. And so he goes to a military hospital and there he sees at that time about 15 bodies that to him were obviously civilians, most likely those protesters that have been tortured to death or executed at the hands of the security forces. And Caesar's initial reaction is to, is to have not, first of all, shock that his own government is, is capable and willing to do this to its own citizens. And he wanted to have nothing to do with it. He wanted to, to defect, to get out. And he reached out to a close friend of his and, and, and to other contacts sort of uh, outside Syria to see how this could be done. And, and although sort of this was possible that he could just escape and, and he didn't even want to take photos of, you know, of, of what was going on. Um, he made the very courageous decision to actually stay. And for two and a half years in Damascus alone, so keep in mind, this is a snapshot both in time and in geography, um, in a very you know, specific city in Syria, Caesar documented 50, almost 55,000 um, and was able to smuggle out almost 55,000 photographs of men, women, children, elderly, Muslims and Christians and Kurds and Arabs. I mean, the whole mosaic of, of Syrian society that had been in the most sadistic and heinous ways tortured to death uh, in the regime's dungeons. And you have to think that for two and a half years, this, this man was, you know, when he was taking photos or when he was back in his office, he was smuggling out uh, a flash drive in his socks uh, under his clothes, going through multiple checkpoints 
having to deal with areas held by the Syrian opposition and by the Assad regime as he went back and forth home every day. And at any point, you know, if he was caught, he knew that he would be the person on the other side of the lens uh, that he took so many pictures of. And so for Syrians, we knew what happened. Um, you know, just from our family members and others that had been arrested, what happens in these intelligence branches. But this was an opportunity to show the world what was going on in Syria today by a photographer within the regime itself, so bravely every single day at huge risk to him, to his entire extended family, being able to document day by day. And when things got scary, when the security situation became critical, the decision was made for Caesar to escape. And so escaping with the remaining documentation he was able to take even at the last minute, some that show command responsibility, um, the photographs, the hard drives, etc. he was able to get out. And today, Caesar is in Western Europe and did not stop. He came and testified before the House Foreign Affairs Committee in 2014, surrounded in the United States House of Representatives, surrounded by the photos that he took. Um, he became instrumental in pushing the multiple legal cases um, that Ambassador Rapp can speak more to across Europe and other places and potential future ones. Um, and even worked in ways to help not just raise awareness, but to try to deter what's happening uh, and to stop what's happening today. I remember in the Oval Office, both under President Obama, uh, meeting with Ben Rose at the time, Deputy National Security Advisor, um, and in the National Security Council meeting with President Trump's National Security Advisor, Caesar, always says that the people that I took photographs of are dead, they're gone. But there are hundreds of thousands of others that are awaiting that same fate, and we must save them. It's our obligation, and here's the proof of what goes on in these prisons. I can probably okay. talk Thank for you. hours. Thank you. <laughs> about Thank you, Moaz. Now that's a, that's Caesar, a very good introduction. I just wanted uh, to give that quick um, overview of who he is, and and that's really one of the main reason that we're all able to to be here today with the exhibit. Thank you very much, Moaz. I will then give the floor to Omar. Uh, to say something about what this exhibition actually shows. In prison, I actually didn't have a name. Uh, I had a number. So to be presented by Omar, it's, it's something that gives me, you know, life again, uh, because we're being, we're being kept there to be dead, not to be alive, not to be sitting here in the archive after, after three years. Um, I made it out because my mom is a strong, amazing mother. That worked hard to get me out of prison. But in prison, Caesar was taking the photos, but before that, people was getting arrested and were getting tortured, and people die under torture, starvation, and mental torture. And then they go to Caesar when he takes the pictures of them. I was detained many times for some reasons and for no reasons. I was detained for my name, for just holding my name Omar, I was detained. And I was detained because I was in demonstration and I was detained when I was high school kid, sitting home. They just attacked, they took me to prison and they put me, put me in prison for three years. <laughs> three years, it's not normal three years. So it doesn't go as fast as the three years you have. In prison, three years goes very slowly so you can Im feel it like a million years. And you leave it every single day. They're going to take you to torture. They're going to hurt you. And you may die now. Being in a place like Arkiv in a prison where people being tortured to death. It's like for me being inside now a prison, but I'm not there to be tortured. I'm there for justice. I'm there to just take those guards and say, stop. And that's powerful. That's meaningful for me. I remember myself sitting in a square, a small square, in a prison. Exactly. That's how I sat in three years. I slept in this way, and I was awake this way. That's everything I had in three years. Then I made it out. But before that, I had to go through hell every day. Go to the bathroom, 35 meters. There's guard to the right, to the left. They taught me the whole way. And I sit in the bathroom, and I have 10 seconds. Because there are thousands of prisoners inside and there's five bathrooms to use. 
So the guard outside is counting one, two, and when they say nine, you have to be out. Otherwise, you may be killed. Because every action you take and every action you don't take in a prison may kill you. And that's how you live in so many ways. I remember the guard came one day and chose me to go to the death room. It's the isolation room where you collect all the dead bodies. And they take me and I, I, was, I was glad, I was happy because, you know, by just walking to the death room, I was moving, you know, my muscles. I was, I was being alive again, moving, you know. Not just sitting in a small square, the, the, the blood is not moving in my body. See, I will die. So they took me to the death room and I was like kept in a room with dead bodies, and they gave me a pen and write numbers on dead bodies in their forehead. I was like, the first person who dies will be number one, the second one will be number two, the third one will be number three, and numbering those dead bodies, it was scary to be in a death room with all those dead bodies, because one day the guard will be busy, they will close the room, and will they will leave you inside until you die, because you had no value. You were we were not human for the guard. They never thought of us like human. They never call us with our names. I never saw like you do in, in prison. It's not like just they torture you. You're not allowed to look up. You're not allowed to, to look at them. You're not, you're not allowed to speak. So imagine if you are in prison for years and you're not allowed to speak. You're whispering with other prisoners because if they hear your voice, they may kill you. Any small reason will kill you. So going to the death room, seeing my best friend is dying, I carry him to the death room, and my, my, my cousin who died in my arms, and I was taking him back from the bathroom. And I remember carrying Bashir, and Bashir was my favorite person on this planet. The person I loved the most, the, 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 the person who I first, the first time I ate hamburger was with, with Bashir, the first time I had motorcycle was with Bashir, the first time we had everything was with Bashir, and Bashir was with me in prison. And he told me that he wanted to die because his brother and sister been tortured and they died. And he can't get out to his mother and his mother will ask him, where is, your, wh where is your siblings? And he can't just say they died and he could not do anything for them. So he wanted to die and they're torturing him and he's starving and he stopped eating. So I was forced to carry him to the bathroom every day. I could not carry myself, but I wanted him to be alive so I can be alive. Somebody to protect me, somebody to be next to me. To the I don't want to be alone. And I remember that day when I was carrying him back from the bathroom, somebody else behind me knocking my shoulder, say, oh much, stop, stop walking. Bashir is dead in your arms. So I look at his face and he was asleep. So I just say, Bashir, wake up. You have to wake up now. We, could, we may die. And I shake, shake, like he tried to move and he started to be heavier than, than before. And then just he fell from my arms, dead, and I was alone. Taking Bashir to the room again, I see him as a number. He wasn't Bashir any anymore. Because that's how the God was working in years to change my way of thinking, change my emotions, my feelings, my thoughts, my, my, how, how my sight, how I see the world, how I see my cousin, the people I love the most. I lost Bashir and I lost everything. I had no more feelings, I didn't care anymore, I just wanted to survive as long as possible in prison. So going every day and seeing the people die, they become numbers, even for me. Because it's the only way to survive. Y if you are a human in prison, in Syrian prisons, you won't survive. You need to be a robot, you need to be just like forgot all the human values. And that's what the guard in prison works on. Because if you survive, they don't want you to survive as a human. They want you to be depressed. That's why when they put me out of prison to execute me, they put me and they said, aim, load, and shoot, poof. And they died. For the first time in my life, it was the first time I died. I didn't know how it feels to die. And they just mock executed me, so they, they, they just, they increased the, the the level of fear I had inside of me, and they did. The fear I had was, was you know, unspeakable. I could not think I was alive. I thought I was dead, and now my afterlife started. And I was like kind of confused, a little bit happy, but worried. I'm alone here in my afterlife. There was nobody around. 
They work so hard to break us, to break every single human thought we had in our brains. And that's what we need to fight against. And that's why we need to be in Arkiva today. Because it's where people have been tortured. And we'll be here and smiling. Thank you very much, Omar, for this very powerful um, intervention. And I will now turn to, we will come back to this a little bit later, to Stephen Rapp. Now, uh, would you uh, explain to the audience how this massive documentation, this file documenting all these horrific international crimes when they came out, what happened to the Caesar file, and how did it live to become the exhibition? Well, thank you very much for holding this uh, program. Uh, uh, first, I want to say uh, that uh, in, in, in my background, I've been an international prosecutor for the Rwanda genocide and for the mass crimes that were committed in Sierra Leone, including the, uh, those uh, that were uh, uh, charged against President Charles Taylor, the president of Liberia. And uh, in 2009, I was appointed by President Obama as our global ambassador for, for, for criminal justice uh, uh, in these kinds of cases. And, and obviously, uh, watched as the Arab Spring began and watched as, as the hopes rose in, in Syria that it would become a normal country. And, and, and tens and really hundreds of thousands of people took to the streets and, uh, and, 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 and cheering always peaceful, peaceful, peaceful change. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, tried to press for a, a democratic opening for a government that would uh, support their human rights and aspirations. And, uh, and certainly what we saw from outside was the regime reacted with, with, with brutal violence, uh, basically made the decision that anybody that was anywhere near uh, a protest, anybody who was from a town that had protested, uh, uh, those folks would be disappeared and, and, and thrown into, uh, into dungeons uh, of the kind that Omar has described. And, and only a few would emerge, and they'd be so broken and 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 and, uh, and wounded that they would discourage uh, they would discourage others. But meanwhile, uh, thousands disappeared, and there was no information on them. Uh, it was really remarkable when we heard of, of this this military defector, uh, military police defector. He was an investigator who who came out of of, of Syria at the end of 2013. Uh, with Moaz's assistance, I, I first spoke with him in, in early uh, 2014, and, and we worked to get his his evidence uh, to the world. And it, it's a remarkable trove of evidence. Uh, I've often said that in the case of the crimes of the Syrian regime, we have better evidence than I had in Rwanda or Sierra Leone, uh, and in some respects even better than the uh, uh, than the Allies had uh, uh, when they prosecuted the, the Nazi war criminals who were responsible for, for the for the torture center where this archive is, is uh, located today. Um, and, and, and a key part of it is, is the Caesar photos. Uh, Amoa said uh, 50,000 photos, that's what he brought out. Uh, uh, but of them, there were about 27,000 that represented a particular period in the detention facilities from about the end of 2011, uh, when the regime began to, to number uh, the people. They didn't put names on them. Uh, and, uh, and when the bodies came out of the various security service dungeons, uh, they contained the name of the, pr the, the number of the prisoner uh, and, the, and the unit where they had been tortured to death. Uh, units like uh, Unit 215 of military intelligence and, and, and 235 also of military intelligence, the famous Palestine branch or, or, uh, or 251 of general intelligence. And, and those, those corpses showed up uh, at military hospitals, uh, Tizreen, where, uh, where um, uh, um, Caesar went to work uh, in order to photograph uh, um, evidence. And, and he'd go there and there'd be 50 or 60 bodies that had been dumped. Uh, later on, the, the, the numbers grew too great to even use Tizreen because it was also used for, for, for soldiers. And he, it, they moved to Meza, which is right close to where President uh, Assad had a presidential mansion. And, and over the course of, as has been said, uh, through August of 2013, um, with the encouragement of his family, uh, of, of, of family members and others, uh, he stayed in there. And, 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 and after uh, the photos were taken by himself and his team, and they were, and, uh, and, and they were printed up for sort of phony criminal files uh, that the military justice would do nothing about, uh, he copied those and brought them back and, and, and downloaded them on a hard drive and, and did that uh, for a period of about two years. 
to the point that in the numbering uh, cases, he had 27,000 photos of, of numbered prisoners with the, the, with the place they'd been tortured to death on their forehead. And Omar has described how he himself was writing those numbers on corpses, including those of his, of his brother who was tortured to death in Unit 215. And uh, 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 in, in total from that 27,000, we can identify almost 6,800 individual human beings. Uh, and uh, it's just incredible, about four or five pictures of each, eyes gouged out, uh, uh, limbs sometimes uh, amputated while they were alive, all emaciated, all with horrible burns from, from lying in their own excrement in, in, in jail cells with uh, underground with hundreds of, of, of others. And, uh, and that's what Caesar brought us. Now, of course, anyone looking at this, and of course, Assad, when he's been confronted by international journalists, has said, ah, fake news, Photoshop. And a key uh, thing that I dealt with was to get uh, this material to the FBI so they can analyze and determine whether it had been photoshopped. I mean, if you look at the metadata that, that comes with a digital image, you can tell whether it's, uh, whether it's been taken on more than, in more than one second, whether it includes uh, uh, composite images, and, and this, this information didn't. Uh, since then, it's been analyzed by the Cologne and, and, and Freiburg Medical Institutes. Uh, uh, and, and, and every photo has turned out to be rock solid, single images, no pixels out of place. These are, as the FBI said, real people and, and, and real events. And, and, and so we, we had this evidence of the regime itself in facilities under the control of President Assad, under the control of people like Jamil Hassan, the head of military, uh, the head of Air Force Intelligence, Ali Mamluk, head of the National Security Bureau, torturing Syrians to death. And, and, and that was, it was incredible evidence. And, and we worked then to, to get that evidence to national systems. Uh, uh, Sarita will talk about some of the mechanisms that have been established, the Commission of Inquiry, the, 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 the mechanism to build files. Uh, of course, there have been civil society organizations involved in this process as, as well. Uh, but it's been possible to put, on, put together uh, the biggest trove of evidence of, of, of a machinery of death since the Holocaust. And, and of course, the challenge has been finding a court to take it to, because we don't have, uh, we don't, we can't take it to a Yugoslavia or Rwanda tribunal. Security Council established those, uh, and that, uh, and the Russians veto everything on Syria, even the most modest criticism of Syria is vetoed. Uh, chemical weapons. There was a short investigation, and they vetoed its extension. Uh, so you can't go there. The ICC doesn't have jurisdiction otherwise, because it's uh, Syria is not a member. And, uh, and so we've tried to find other ways to bring it to, to, bring it to court. Uh, uh, Caesar uh, emerged. I, I met him. I've seen him a dozen times uh, since then in Washington and in his country of exile not long ago again, uh, and, and continues to be pushing for justice. Uh, thrilled that he was recently named by Time magazine one of the most 100 influential people in the world. Uh, he sometimes doesn't feel that way. Sometimes he feels like the whole world's ignored it. He's brought up, out evidence. Uh, uh, you know, his photos alone are, are, are two or three times the, the I mean, individuals uh, that were tortured at the center there in, in Norway. And, uh, and, and what's happened? Yeah. <laughs> Not Nuremberg. Uh, where, where, is, where is justice? And so that's been the real challenge for him. But I think uh, the world has gradually found ways to, to bring these cases forward. I was just in Koblenz, and I'll talk about that, uh, where two Syrian alleged torturers are on trial here in Germany under universal jurisdiction. So, so justice is beginning to happen, but it wouldn't have happened uh, without Caesar, and it needs to continue. Thank you very much. Now we will come back to ongoing trials and what is actually happening uh, in Europe and elsewhere. Now, Sareta, in, in 2013, when the Caesar file was brought out, you were at the Commission of Inquiry, and uh, you have been uh, dealing with a lot of evidence of international crimes being committed in, in the Syrian uh, conflict. Now, can you explain a little bit to us how, how the Caesar file compares to others and what it is that, ha that is very peculiar with this particular load of documentation. Ah, we cannot hear you. We cannot, you need to unmute yourself. Thank you for having me. Um, yes, I'm going to speak a little bit about uh, what the exhibition that the Caesar photos um, said about international crimes in Syria and how they fit into the kind of broader um, evidence information that had been collected, particularly Sereta? Sereta? in- uh, I am going to ask you to speak a little bit slower because these are not oh. native speakers. So if you can just slow down a little bit, please. <laughs> yes. 
sorry, Trinidadian sense it very quickly, so I will slow down. <laughs> Um, I think, uh, yes, uh, thanks for having me. I'm going to speak a little bit more about um, what the exhibition documents, what international crimes in Syria and how the information photographs that Caesar brought out with him um, fitted as part of a larger tranche of evidence in relation to the detention center related abuses in Syria. Um, in Syria, since uh, the eruption of civil unrest in 2011, which then spiraled into a non-international armed conflict uh, in early 2012, and that conflict continues to this day, massive and systematized violence against civilians, um, largely against civilians, including the torture and killing detainees in official and major detention centers, has been an entrenched feature of the Syrian conflict. Um, it's important at the outset to, to, to state explicitly that the violations that are happening inside detention centers, the violation that Omar so viscerally described, um, take place far from the battlefield. Um, these are not deaths for which any legal justification of military necessity um, could ever be made. Um, throughout the unrest and the conflict, there had been consistent reports, largely coming from former detainees, about the government's use of torture and um, the commission of death in custody. Um, for example, in, in February 2016, so after the Caesar photos came out, the Commission of Inquiry released a report on deaths in, in detention, in which it went through its records and looked at all the statements concerning people who had been detained in Syrian government detention, um, intelligence and security agencies, and military hospitals in particular. And there were over 600 individual statements, individual unique statements at that stage in the, in the records of the Christian inquiry. Every single person who had been detained reported torture, and the majority of people also reported witnessing death in detention as well. Nevertheless, the, the, these deaths were taking place in their total secrecy. And despite you know, the UN reporting on it, in some cases the media reporting on it, um, the impact was not was largely being lost in the national and political discourse, despite of despite the devastating impact on the lives of millions of Syrians. It was the photographs that were smuggled out by uh, the photographer Caesar that really brought fully into the the widespread systematic use of torture and mass killing being perpetrated in detention center and military hospitals um, run by the Syrian government, and notably detention centers run by its security and intelligence agencies. Of the about 55,000 images uh, of, that were smuggled out, by, that, 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 smuggled out by Caesar, it's really impossible once you see them to put them to one side. They are, in, in, they are in an entirely different nature than, for example, reading uh, uh, media reporting or UN reporting, um, they cannot be easily, and nor should they be forgotten. And they were very revealing of the detentions for which, the violations for which the commission documentation body had been really seeing in the accounts they were hearing from people who had been detained. And one of the things that it made clear was the use of torture in, um, in what was documented about the state of the body, um, also the inhuman conditions. Um, we saw very clearly the impact of um, starvation and medical care in, in the photograph with many of the bodies in the Caesar photographs being um, emaciated. Um, it also spoke um, to the scale of death and detention and the near industrial nature surrounding um, the um, killing of detainees in detention as well as um, deaths by omission due to um, the, the horrific conditions of detention under which people were held and the complete um, lack of care and indeed um, aggravation, exacerbation of those conditions by um, agents of the Syrian government. The photographs also reveal a highly methodical system. They show themselves an internal classification system that pointed to a countrywide um, architecture of torture and killing. So you've heard that, you know, sometimes the bodies were labeled with numbers. Some of those numbers also so uh, the pension that from before coming, for example, to the military hospital. Through that, they also illuminate the of the perpetrator and bringing into sharp relief the lack of humanity that has characterized the policies and practices of the Syrian, uh, Syrian government throughout the conflict and certainly in regards to the, their behavior inside the detention centers that they run.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Saretta. Uh, now, um, all of you basically touched upon this uh, a little bit, but I would very much invite you to, to reflect on the, um, the effects of the Caesar file, because such massive documentation is very, very unusual, is, is perhaps one of, of the most documented, uh, largest uh, gatherings of documentation of international crimes uh, in the history uh, of humankind, so to speak. Now, you would expect this to really have a huge impact on a number of levels, uh, particularly given how the world has spoken about accountability, about justice, about intervention to prevent mass atrocities over the last two to three decades. Now, I would very much invite all of you from your perspective to reflect on what were the expectations when the Caesar file was brought about and what have you seen of action since then. And I would want to start with Stephen and I invite you to, to reflect on this issue. Well, th there has been a response, uh, you know, from the point of view of the, s of the survivors of the torture uh, or the family members uh, we still don't even know about their loved ones. It, it's not sufficient. But uh, uh, after the Caesar photos came out, and uh, and and with the assistance of the group around him, a presentation was made at a meeting in Paris in May of 19, uh, 2014. Uh, uh, the French Foreign Minister was so outraged, uh, he said, "We need to take this to the Security Council." At that point, uh, the the uprising had been suppressed for three years. Uh, the UN had stopped counting at 350,000 dead. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, take it to the Security Council and demand uh, that this be referred to the International Criminal Court. And uh, people say, well, the Russians will veto it. It's no hope, but so we need, to, we need to, to do that. And there was even an informal session of the Security Council where the, where the, where the photos were presented. And the resolution came forward, and, and uh, the United States, not a member of the ICC, strongly supported it. Uh, um, countries from the global south, Rwanda and others, supported it. But, of course, Russia and China voted no. So it was 13 yes, two no. Those two no's were, were, were vetoes. Uh, but then that uh, led to uh, continued efforts uh, by, uh, by friendly states, by states that believe in justice, to, to press forward for, for accountability, uh, support uh, documentation beyond the Caesar photos to show the sort of orders uh, uh, under which this torture took place. Uh, uh, Sarita can talk about uh, the establishment of the international mechanism. General Assembly couldn't uh, knew the Security Council was blocked, so at the end of 2016, a mechanism was established to, to bring together uh, evidence like the Caesar photos and other material gathered by NGOs and from the Commission of Inquiry, where Sarita worked, and, and really work on developing cases. Uh, the, those of us uh, that are involved in justice and then prosecutors uh, look to, to uh, third countries of course, in Norway, you've had uh, prosecutions of people that have committed crimes in Rwanda, for instance, who've come to, uh, uh, to Norway as refugees, as if they're victims when they're victimizers. And there have been those units that have done this kind of work. And we wanted to see that same thing done. And, uh, and, and Germany and France in particular, uh, uh, um, certainly uh, Scandinavian countries have, have cases that are in process. Uh, but the Germany and France have particularly stepped up uh, to, to pursue these cases. And, of course, this occurred at the same time that the crimes of ISIS began. And, and, and of course, from a European standpoint, looking at the crimes of ISIS and, and the fact that some ISIS uh, members commit horrible crimes uh, of terror within European countries, there's a tendency to say, well, those are the real criminals. But to a large extent, uh, it was Assad that was supporting those folks. He wanted to create a situation where the West would have to choose between him and, and the extremists. And, and uh, uh, and there was never a uh, control of, of eastern Syria by ISIS until uh, Assad basically destroyed all of the sort of natural uh, opposition of, of the whole moderate community, secular community, Sunni communities that could have fought those folks. And so we did have this ISIS crisis. So people said, let's do these cases. But fortunately, because of the Caesar photos and because of the nature of the evidence, it was possible to begin to develop uh, cases in, in, in Europe. and. Uh, uh, France put out international arrest warrants uh, against uh, uh, the head of, of Syrian military intelligence and, and, uh, and National Security Bureau, and, and the Germans did as well. And then uh, a, uh, about a year and a half ago, two torturers were arrested, alleged torturers in Germany, 
And we now have that case uh, proceeding in, in Koblenz and going very well. And the, every, every witness is talking about the, about the seizure evidence because the individuals that are on trial were in Unit 251 of general intelligence. And, and of the seizure photos, 446 represent victims tortured to death in, in that facility. And there was, was in court this week in, 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 in Germany. And, and saw those uh, the, so those photos uh, presented. So we are seeing some uh, justice that's that's happening. Uh, Moaz can talk about uh, the political response in the U.S. with the Caesar uh, bill, and yeah. there have been other things that have been done. But uh, uh, but Thank the you. path to justice is 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 still there. There are other perpetrators present in Europe. Uh, there are people that frankly are in this regime that need to be charged and put under arrest warrant. So. Uh, they may not be uh, arrested tomorrow, but you know we've got actually some folks from even from from Auschwitz that are still being charged in Germany or 96 years old. The the message has to be clear if you're involved in these kinds of crimes. There's no escaping it in this life. Absolutely. And so we're beginning uh, to do that, and we wouldn't be able to do it without the Caesar photos. But uh, it, it's not enough. But it's uh, but it is a sign that the justice is is coming. Thank you very much. Now I would uh, welcome to you, Moaz. You welcome back. Uh, we are very happy to see your face. Now, uh, did you get the question? I would very much like you to reflect on the importance of the Caesar uh, exhibition for prompting action as a Syrian activist and how has the response been? What, what were your expectations when the file came out and how has this, uh, what has it resulted in so far? So just wanted to make sure first, is it the sound clear on this yes. connection? Perfect. The floor is Great. yours. So, um, you know, it's a very important question, what you've asked. And the fact is that it's been too little. And it's been shockingly, um, sort of the world has shockingly sort of ignored, in a way, the Caesar um, photos and what they show inside these prisons. And the reason I say that is it's not to belittle the amazing work that's due to the, to the just amazing perseverance of Ambassador Rapp, um, the, the powerful alliance uh, that we've had with the Holocaust Museum and the great you know, law firms and others that have helped at least start national court cases, produced legislation like, like the Caesar Serious Civilian Protection Act. Um, but again, these things are like fixes to a broken system. The ICC and, and, an, and an international court that's not available, and hopefully in the future we'll get there. And I know that the road to justice is long, um, but with with amazing experts and friends like Ambassador Rapp and allies like the Holocaust Museum and others, I know we'll get there in time. But the fact is, people are being tortured to death right now. There are children that are born in prison whose mothers have trouble giving, telling them a story to go to sleep at night because if they did said a bird bird landed on the tree, the kid has no reference. He or she has never seen a tree, have never seen a bird. What's heartbreaking is the thousands of photos that we have, the numbers and the emaciated and tortured bodies. They're real people. And for the majority of them, we don't know their names. They're, whenever we do find out, when a family reaches out and says, that's my brother or that's my sister, the first thing, it, it's always, it's never an easy process. But then they ask, they say they want justice, they want accountability, and they want this to end for other members that may be arrested. And when it comes to the justice question, I have to ask, well, do they also have, happen to have Swedish citizenship, or French, or, or Canadian, or, or, or from the United States, or elsewhere? Because that's the only way to even, you know, start potentially a national court case. Because there is no ICC because the Security Council referral gets vetoed by the Russians or the Chinese. And so it reiterates to them that somehow their blood is less valuable than others, that if they had another nationality, that somehow the world would care more. The same applies, by the way, do, in our work to try to bring detainees home. We at the Syrian Emergency Task Force work with American families who have loved ones in these very same dungeons. And the reason we're able to do more and, and work with the government government here and otherwise that get media attention is because they're American citizens that are being held. Well, what about the men, women, children, elderly, or Syrians that are there? When I first saw the Caesar photos, I was in Doha. 
in the Middle East, and I was looking through. And I don't like to talk, talk about this, but I had some of somebody from my own family that had been arrested. And so the times didn't match, but I was still going through that same intelligence branch because I wanted to see if maybe their picture is there. Um, and it was horrific as I went through one by one. And, but I did think that once we took the photos and put them all over the world, that, that the whole world would just pay attention to this. As Sarita said, no one would turn away from such a powerful pile. But the fact is, despite having the Caesar exhibit in the UK Parliament, in the UN General Assembly, and the US Congress, and in the Canadian Parliament, and in Dublin, and in Rome, and in Spain, and everywhere else, um, a lot of people still don't even know about the Caesar file, they don't know about what's happening in Syria. When they think about Syria, they think about ISIS, or they think about a war that's going on forever. They don't understand that this is a country that isn't used to perpetual war. And they think about refugees and terrorism, but they don't understand that these people are running away from these detention systems. And so I fear that the, the, the reaction that is due that should be what is expected is not come through. And one last thing, and, and I'll end there, you know, whenever even there is a court case, let's say a national court case in Spain or, or, or one in France uh, or, or in Germany, et cetera, a lot of times when the cameras go away and the law firms go away, these key witnesses and their families, like Caesar, or these key like like uh, sort of families of, of victims that have been brave enough to allow us to start a court case, like the Spanish victims, widow and, and, and orphans, they're left alone. There is a black hole in, in, in a giant void in this international, even accountability and legal system where there is no safety net for these people that are risking everything, not just on behalf of their own stories and loved ones, but on behalf of the hundreds of thousands uh, of others that demand justice. And I think that's a major flaw that's also unaddressed that should be, everyone should be sympathizing with this. So two things, there needs to be more support to these brave victims and their families and witnesses. And everyone needs to focus, not just on the accountability side, and we'll fight that as many years as it takes us to, but also when it comes to stopping the ongoing machinery of death, the genocidal massacres in slow motion that are happening there that are more horrific than even the chemical weapons that attacks and the conventional weapons attacks against civilians every day. And, okay. and unfortunately, I have not seen that reaction. And I hope that people's consciences move to move their governments to stop this killing. Thank you very much, Moaz. Now, uh, the lack of, of uh, let's say, political engagement and continued action is one thing. Now, I wanted to ask you, Omar, as a, as a victim of torture in Syria, how has the Caesar file affected you? Because as, as you would think that a number of torture victims around the world from other conflicts and other uh, dictatorships, they also are victims, but they cannot prove it. Now, how has the Caesar file affected you? Uh, I would like to start by saying I, I like to, to introduce myself as a survivor, not a victim because the victim is kind of weak word in this world. So I'd like survivor, I'm strong. Uh, but I remember one month in prison where torture was less, food was more, and that was the month when the Caesar photos was released. So the, enti the, the entire world was talking about the Caesar photos. They've been here and there in parliaments and the governments and everybody's talking about the Caesar photos, people who've been killed under torture in Syria and kids and women and other people, Christian and Muslim and different groups and different people, everybody's talking about them. So the guards in prison, they get scared and maybe brought to court to justice one day. So they stopped or they tortured us less and they gave us more food, more water for one month. And do you know what is the dream of a Syrian prisoner? It's to eat once, be full, and die. Because the starvation level in Syrian prisons is nothing you can think of. Because we had a father who killed his kid to eat his bread in prison. It's systematic torture and systematic starvation so they can turn people against each other in prison. 
So that was the, the most hopeful month in my time in prison is when the guard was scared because this, the photos was released. And so we got more food, we got less torture. And then after one month, we talked a lot about these photos, every media is talking about it, the NRK or CNN or Fox News, everybody's talking about them. How long did they talk about it? For one month. After that, the subject got, you know, colder and the guard got warmer though. So the guard got back, increased the level of torture and decreased the, the amount of food. And that is the cause of our silence for those people in Syrian prisons. So when we are silent, people get tortured. People die every day because you're not speaking out. And people ask me, Omar, you told your story at least four or five thousand times. Isn't that enough? No, it's not. And I will tell, tell it a million times if I can because I know I experienced myself. I have the experience that when I talk, people may survive or people may get food. And that's why I talk. And that's why you should talk. First, you should listen, understand the story, get the information, then use it at least by speaking or writing or telling or whatever, because everybody has their own skills. And people can talk, can write, can communicate. Use your platforms, your social media, whatever you have to change the world, not change everything. Don't free those people, you can't. But you can take small action and I can take small action. And then we have a lot of small actions, will be great action that will lead to the release of those detainees who've been tortured every day. They think about you. Are those people around there, the other side and the democratic world thinking of me, trying to get me out of prison? And that's exactly what they're waiting for. They're waiting for us, you know? They're waiting for me, for you, for every single human being, for a child, for an adult, for elderly people to do something, not listen and ignore, go home and you got back to your life. Take actions immediately because your actions are important. Thank you, Omar. Now, Sareta, um, can we trust the justice system? Is that where accountability will eventually get there? And could you please explain to the audience, uh, we have been listening to the establishment of the International Criminal Court. We have a lot of trials going on in Europe under universal jurisdiction from previous wars during the 1990s. We have the International Tribunal for Yugoslavia, for Rwanda, and so forth. And yet here we are with this massive documentation and we are seven years on. Can you explain to the public where is accountability and where is justice? And unmute yourself, please. Uh, unmute yourself, yes, thank you. Um, at the outset, just to say that these photographs, they are not documenting history. They are a window into what continues to occur inside Syria um, yesterday, today, and if no action has been taken tomorrow. When the Caesar photos came out, and even, and even up until this day, they are present and often present very explicitly in conversations about accountability for crimes committed in Syria. Certainly they hold evidential value, but in many ways, their, arguably their greatest value has been in the Syrian image, in which it's very difficult to put to one side um, and allow the political life to take over. Um, from the level of state, what the photographs brought on were the, were the true um, cost of unity. Um, it achieving accountability for Syria, Syria indelibly on gender. Um, and it provided lots of sustenance to the now very long-term effort to carve a path towards justice. Well, what does that actually mean in practice? Um, it means that there that the path to international to justice at an international level was blocked, not just for Syria to be honest, but also for Iraq, so for now for Yemen. And that's part of partly because 
the appetite for setting up a tribunal um, that existed in the 90s at the time of uh, the Rwanda Tribunal and the Tribunal of Yugoslavia. Um, there isn't that push towards it. And I think there's a number of different reasons for that, one of which is, is financial. The other is that we now have the International Criminal Court, of course, of course the permanent court. Um, and there is no path at the moment for moving this case, these cases before the ICC. Syria is not a party to the ICC. Uh, it, the Security Council is not going to refer Syria to the ICC due to the exercise of veto power um, by Russia and China. There had been one attempt that had been made despite numerous resolutions on, on uh, numerous resolutions have come before the Security Council, almost all of which have referenced the horrific um, violence and violations that are happening in Syria. There's been one attempt to move it before the ICC, which uh, which um, which failed, and an attempt has been made since then. As a result of the kind of blockages and paralysis at that international level, at the level of kind of international criminal justice, we've seen a lot more innovations in trying to find a path. One of this, one creation of the IM by the General Assembly, uh, December 2016. Um, its establishment itself is, a, is an innovation. It's a, a result of essentially them not being able to the Security Council, if not being able to go to us the Security Council. But we've also seen a number of different actions at, at the national domestic level. And I think Syria has really proven that the importance of these national trials to the international criminal justice experiment has continued to, to deepen. Um, and one that one of the examples is ongoing now, the, the Koblinch trial in relation to uh, which is, it looks at the crimes against humanity of, of torture and uh, killing inside Syrian government detentions. It also includes the more recent action by the, the Netherlands um, just uh, just last month in September, um, which has started, uh, um, has notified the Syrian government of its intention to hold the government accountable for torture under the Convention Against Torture, um, looking like it's gearing up towards a, a, a state state matter before the International uh, Court of Justice. For individuals in civil society, this, uh, when we talk about justice and accountability, the CESAR photo has made it, made it more likely that there will continue to be sustainable funding to work on accountability, um, particularly for those that are doing case building and accountability driven documentation. It also means that as the hostilities in Syria tamp down and the Syrian government tries to make steps to join the kind of larger community of nations, the Caesar photos also serve as a bulwark against any form of real politique that would motivate states to try to look past the crimes committed by the Syrian state. And of course, from the view of the courtroom, the Caesar photographs provide evidence of a pattern of violation, the organized, the industrial nature of the violation, and they also provide line of inquiry as to the deceased. As I said, you know, photographs generally recall history, but in the case of the Caesar photographs, these are not yet history. Um, as Omar Moaz and Ambassador Rapp have said, hundreds of thousands of people remain detained in Syrian government detention centers, all of them with a web of families and loved ones looking for them, waiting for them in cases, not knowing their fate or their whereabouts. Some yeah. of those people have already perished and their families are uninformed and still searching for them. Um, in visiting the exhibition that is being put on uh, um, at the museum, you know, it's also part of, of bearing witness to what is happening, to knowing what is going on in the world that you live in. But it's also a call to action to rouse oneself from the safety of the place where you are now, where if you are in a safe place, to act even in small ways in one's own country, in one's own community, to forward on accountability. Yeah, thank you very much, Sareta. I think uh, this last uh, element is perhaps what makes this exhibition extraordinary, that this is not merely pictures of crimes that were committed sometimes in the past, but they actually bear witness to ongoing crimes as we speak. They have been going on for seven years since this was published and brought out to the world. Now, I think we are going to take a little round of questions from the audience. Please raise your hand if you have any questions. This is your op opportunity. You have some of the four most, the most distinguished experts in the world to question, so don't be shy. Hello. Thank you so much for a very, very interesting uh, panel, and uh, also to Akiva for, for hosting, hosting us. Um, I have two questions. 
Uh, one is uh, perhaps directed at uh, Umar, and um, I'm just wondering, so we, we speak about justice, uh, and I think a lot of people have different connotations and understandings of justice, uh, and I would like you to, to speak more specifically about what do you mean, what is the first couple of things that you think about when you hear the word justice. Uh, and the second question is picking up on, on what uh, uh, Moas was talking about with the need for more action. Uh, and I'm thinking we're sitting in Norway and we have a Norwegian government that boasts about its uh, support for human rights. But what can the, hum what can the Norwegian government do and what, what, ca what more can be done from, uh, from, from Scandinavia, so to speak, in terms of achieving justice? Uh, for the crimes that have been committed in, in Syria. And just as a last point, my name is uh, Aspen Stokke. I'm a PhD candidate uh, studying uh, Syrian uh, human rights uh, fight by, by activists like the ones that we have here. Now, Omar, will you want to go first? Sure. Justice. I don't believe whatever we do with the guard who tortured me for many years whatever we can, we can do with this person, it will never be justice. Even if we take this person and we torture him exactly the same amount of belts, exactly the same amount of hours, of minutes, that wouldn't be the same. I, will get, I won't get back the years I lost my life. I won't get those people who died with me in prison. I won't get anything back, right? So there was no, you know, 100% justice we can get. But when I think about justice, I think about a way we use to stop what's going on in Syria. When we talk about justice, we can attract more academic people to be involved in the Syrian case, like yourself, come from Bergen to talk about this. It's important. It's more, more interesting question to talk about justice because people sometimes, when it's inside the war, it's like conflict in Syria. It's a, you do, a lot of people dying. You feel like you can't do anything. F anything. You feel like you helpless you can't do anything but when we talk about justice say maybe i can help with the booth maybe i can help with the court help uh, organize something so people got like more interested when they think about justice for me it's a way to tell those people in prison that i still care about them and the way that you use yourself to tell them that we still care because when we do something there will be the government in syria is still arresting people on a daily basis so one prisoner who's been watching TV or have a YouTube channel watching us right now, going to be detained tomorrow, going to be put in prison, and he's going to tell the world, the world in prison, that there's somebody who's talking about you, right? That's the best thing we can do. At least, you know, we can talk about them. That will give them a lot of hope to survive because a lot of them dies because they don't have any more hope. So that's justice in a very short summary. From you. What we can do? A lot. Y there's nothing you can do, but your government won't move any step if you don't move. Because it's, a, it's actually about, you know, votes. It's about the people we're electing. Our problem is in minority countries. We elect those, polit po you know, politicians, and we sleep for four years. Then after four years, we have elections. Then we wake up and we wouldn't vote for those people. We don't follow the news. We don't follow what's going on. We don't want follow what we actually, if we want thing out, what we want. We don't. You say, no, I do. You don't. That's not true. You don't do it you, because you're busy with your life. And you trust without looking. You trust those politicians you, you're voting for. And they go working for four years. They're human. They do mistakes. They guard in prison. They're humans. They do huge mistakes. So we can't just leave it. And I, I believe they can take great actions, but they can't do it themselves. If you are silent, if you're not moving yourself, because they work, they represent you in the government. You, no, nobody else. They don't represent me. It's you. So it's about you. When you move, they move. And they can take big actions Moaz can tell you about. Moaz? That guy loves Remember him. to unmute your... Can, okay, yeah. sorry. So um, I think these are great questions. And I want to say that, um, you know, to, to Omar's point, that, you know, political will 
starts in democratic countries with the people. It starts with the media. It starts with sort of what people are paying attention to. And so if the local populations, if the constituents who are representative, uh, if the media in the country um, and like the great work that's being done today by, by, by this amazing institution of putting on the Caesar exhibit within this panel, these are things that I think get people to start having a discussion and saying that this is important. Because all of us, right, if, if we, you know, I'd like to think, you know, if, if we lived in, you know, during World War II, we would have done anything we can to, I don't know, blow up the, 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 the train track that took six million Jewish people to their deaths. You know, if, if I'd like to think if I knew more and I was older in 1994 and could have done something to lobby for, you know, to stop the machetes from landing in Kigali, um, you know, we would have done all we can. So today we're lucky because we know and, and, and we can act um, to, to stop an ongoing atrocities that are going on in Syria. Now, on the justice side, I, I am not an expert, and Ambassador Rav may know more, others um, may know more uh, about this, but Norway should look at any mechanism it can to start a case that goes after what's happening in terms of the detentions that is going on in Syria, what's happening in terms of the chemical weapons attacks or the targeting of hospitals or schools. These are all horrendous human rights abuses that continue and have done that are incredibly well documented. So, so beginning some sort of accountability process, a national process in Norway, uh, I think is powerful uh, and important, whether that's under universal jurisdiction, whether, but if that is something that's doable there, whether it is through finding a dual national uh, that we can help sort of begin a case that way. So, so having, I think, the political will allows that accountability and justice to take part. Now, when it comes to politically in the ongoing crimes outside of justice and accountability, every country in the world, especially uh, Western democracies that value human rights, uh, Norway, which 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 does tout its sort of important values of both human rights and uh, and, and accountability and, and you know and stands against war crimes, they'll those must be regular statements that are coming out of the highest echelons of, of the Norwegian government, right? Like the Norwegian parliament should have the Caesar exhibit in that parliament because that's something happening today. And that could have a huge effect on members that don't know about what's going on, that could, that could themselves have their own prescriptions of what could be done. If there are allies of Norway that are considering reestablishing relationships with the Assad regime, Norway should be clear in its position that no one, including Norway, could ever establish international uh, diplomatic relations or allow such a criminal regime to be brought back into the international order of things, that he, it does not belong there. Um, and even when, you, you know, of course there are, I'm sure, many Syrian refugees in Norway today, um, I think the narrative that needs to be clarified is that when we ignore these human rights abuses, we ignore what happens in the detention system, we ignore the evidence of the Caesar file or the chemical weapons attacks or the targeting of schools and hospitals, that, that isn't just wrong and goes against the values and morals of Norway and every other democracy, but that also in the long run becomes a national security threat, whether that is with huge you know, loads of refugees that are, that are that are coming that may destabilize domestic politics, whether that is because of extremism that takes advantage of the world looking away from horrific crimes and, and uses its own propaganda to go after vulnerable communities. Um, and, and so it's both a national strategic sort of priority and the right thing to do based on our values uh, in democratic countries to act. And so at least loudly proclaiming that the Assad regime is a non grata international community, reiterating to allies that they cannot reestablish relations um, and, and constantly raising the alarm, even if it's members uh, in the legislature in your country or, your, uh, or, or other officials that are saying, today a bunch of people died in, in an attack on Idlib. There are four million civilians there, a million of them kids. If this offensive continues, that can double the refugees in Europe that will cause massive humanitarian atrocities. And reminding people about what's going on in the 
these detentions and that, and that needs to end outside any negotiation. At least women and children should not be, should be released right away. So Thank using the full force of, of, of Norway's government in raising awareness to its allies in the world and ensuring that the Assad regime understands that it can never be brought back to the international Thank community in establishing Thank any sort of court uh, case in uh, Norway, More. which has a huge symbolic and other uh, powerful sort of effect on and maybe deterring what's happening yes. there. Thank you very much, And sanctioning, uh, as we've done in the United States, these war criminals, because that's sometimes the fastest way of deterrence and accountability until we get an actual was. court case going. Yes. I hope okay, that Okay, thank you. Now, um, I, but I, but I, I do agree with Omar that I, I would when like the to people have care and, last, and move and talk about uh, it in the media, does it in, in the parliament, I would like the Caesar exhibit there, I think okay. that will be greater action. Uh, even Thank from Norway, you. which has been supportive of the Syrian people, at least from my experience. Now, I have one final question before we end. And it goes to Stephen and Sareta. Now, I would very much like sorry, you to be, sorry, to I be, couldn't, to be um, very quick. Uh, I'm having now, a, little having bit of, a little bit of technical difficulty. Technical difficulty. Okay, now, uh, in but, Norway... But I can hear you now. Is everything okay? Now, in, in Norway, there are prosecutions being made against uh, foreign fighters and also against Syrian and Palestinian nationals residing in Norway. Now, the Norwegian prosecutor has every time chosen to prosecute for terrorism or participation in armed conflict. And the last case, which was settled by the Norwegian Supreme Court in June of this year, was a stateless Palestinian who had been filmed in Syria as a commander. And they chose to go for terrorism charges. Now, the, one of the reasons for this is that the prosecutor believes that it is very costly, it is very technically challenging and it is very uncertain to get a conviction if you go for crimes against humanity or for war crimes in a national uh, trial. Now the Germans who opened this trial that is going on against uh, the Syrian uh, torturist said that if Germany doesn't do this Nobody will, because Germany has the money, Germany has the capacity, legally speaking, and if we don't do it, nobody will. Now, my question to you, if there is a conviction in the German case, is that the moment when you could raise the pressure on European nations to proceed to prosecution based on international crimes instead of participation in armed conflict or for terrorism charges and extend this also to uh, members of the Syrian regime. This is my question. I would very much like you to be as short as possible. Well, well let, me, let me try to answer that. Um, and, and do keep in mind that these ISIS and, and jihadist cases and these so-called foreign terrorist fighter cases are, are different than the regime cases of, 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 of the Syrian government and people wearing uniforms, torturing people to death. Um, and, but, I, but I think the, the criticism is correct about cases being pursued solely on terrorism counts. Uh, and, and, and that's often because of the absence of evidence. Fortunately, we have a mechanism now that's working on, on investigations out of Iraq, and a lot of work is being done to uh, to develop more evidence about what people actually did in Syria and Iraq uh, in terms of rape or murder or sexual slavery. Uh, but I think it's, it's always better to charge people for crimes that they committed against uh, innocent others uh, than it is to just charge them for being a member of an organization, even though that organization may have been a very bad one. And, and it's, it's easy for their supporters to think, aha, they're just being a uh, they're just being politically uh, prosecuted they, or, or because of their religious beliefs. And if we're really going to discourage people from joining 
ISIS, we ought to be prosecuting them on the real crimes. And I would note um, in meetings with European prosecutors, including one in The Hague not long ago, everyone who was doing terrorism cases were encouraged also to join with those cases, even if they're doing terrorism, uh, cases based upon actual conduct, to do both. And the Dutch and some others have done that. Now, this is separate from the issue of Syrian regime officials. And of course, Germany, which has taken 800,000 refugees, has uh, dozens, and there are other countries in which people that were, in fact, torturers and worked for the regime came out pretending that they were innocent and, in fact, are implicated in these crimes. Uh, I don't know of any uh, in Norway today, uh, but there may be, and that needs to be a, a better tracking effort. Uh, those folks are less likely, in a way, to be in Europe, because obviously the regime is still in power in Damascus, and those folks are still torturing people to death. Uh, but it is important to pursue those cases, and Norway does have universal jurisdiction. Uh, it can prosecute a case whether there's a perpetrator in country uh, or and whether a citizen uh, of country uh, uh, is, a, is a victim. And I know I've worked with Norwegian prosecutors before. And in terms of sort of sharing the burden, uh, I think it'd be quite appropriate for, for Norway to begin cases along those lines and put out international arrest warrants for individuals who believe might be traveling, who were involved in the chemical weapons attacks or who have been involved in the attacks on hospitals or in, or in the torture cases. I think it's appropriate. And frankly, the, uh, the European Center for, uh, uh, for uh, Constitutional and Human Rights has actually filed a petition uh, with the Norwegian prosecutor to do that. Now, I've talked to the Norwegian prosecutor and investigator, and, and their resources are frankly limited, the size of their units to investigate. So I think that's also a political need in a, in a country that uh, uh, does have a, a public reserves of, of resources uh, to really uh, invest the money to make sure that, uh, uh, that those kind of cases are pursued. I, I'm frankly a believer that European countries should pool their jurisdiction and, and, and do cases uh, jointly uh, and, and find a way to, to, to pursue some higher level individuals as well. Uh, that hasn't happened yet, but, I'm, but I really am, uh, that, that's my, my current cause, because a case here and a case there is, isn't enough. Uh, we need to find another formula. Uh, but, but short of that, countries that have the capacity, the experience, the statute, uh, which uh, I was <laughs> I was there when you passed your statute in, in, in February of 2008 that finally uh, uh, brought international crimes into Norwegian law where they hadn't been uh, under the Criminal Code of 1905. Uh, I, I'd like to see that statute used for these crimes, and it's time for Norway to play a larger role on, on accountability for war crimes in Syria. Thank you, Stephen. Now, 30 seconds from you, Zareda. <laughs> that, that's, that's absolutely fine. I mean, I think the starting point has to be that a justice system has to recognize the crimes that have been committed. They need to call the crimes by their true name. We're speaking a lot about what, uh, what, what justice would mean to the Syrian people. And I think there are some Syrian people, Syrians who would say, we haven't seen any convictions, so perhaps a conviction on terrorism grounds is better than no convictions at all. However, I don't think that people should be expected to, to subsist on crumbs of justice. And I don't think ultimately that they will. I don't think that is what uh, they will hold close to them when it comes to a justice system that only recognizes terrorism and doesn't um, give the opportunity to um, examine in a public forum the crimes that are were committed and are still being committed against Syrians and, for, and the creation of an incontrovertible historical record through the transcripts of those proceedings. For counterterrorism, uh, in, in charging terrorism offenses, you don't have the opportunity to cre create a comprehensive judicial record, um, which can which can then form the basis of a number of other restorative justice mechanisms, such as reparations. They don't afford victim opportunities for victims and witnesses to attend, to testify, to submit questions, and they operate very independently from potentially other truth-seeking initiatives and truth-telling initiatives. So. Um, they are uh, important. I understand the limits of the resources of the prosecutions. They are easier cases to prosecute. But when we're speaking about achieving justice, they don't move us down that path towards justice, in my view. Thank you very much, Sareja. So on that somewhat more optimistic, positive note, there are concrete things that can be, can be done and processes that can be pushed. Uh, and I uh, want just to remind also the public that accountability and justice in these type of cases is a slow, slow process. Uh, but eventually, 
we believe that it will get there. So thank you very much to the panel for sharing your experience and your expertise with us and putting the exhibition into a broader contextual landscape. Uh, and now we are inviting the audience to have a look. Yeah. Uh, I also want to just say a great thank you to this panel, Mr. Muaz Mustaf, uh, Mr. Umar, which is sitting here, and Ms. Zareta in the back, and Mr. Ambassador Stephen Rapp. Thank you very much for joining us and for teaching us about the ongoing war crimes and crimes against humanity in Syria. And also a great thank you to Cecilia harris for moderating this panel uh, with such confidence. <laughs> um, but I also like to give a special thanks to Umar, uh, first for your braveness in sharing your story to the whole world and to bring this injustice into light. Uh, and also secondly, for your tireless effort of bringing the Caesar exhibition here to Akira. So thank you very much for that. Uh, and please give them a warm applause. <laughs> yeah, so we are now very soon going to go down and see the exhibition. Uh, and this, as I said before, you can just sit down if you want. Merci. We're going to just say something in one minute. Um, yeah, you're going to see this exhibition in the original torture chamber uh, and also in some of the reconstructed prison cells. And we have to warn you that the photo uh, photographs you're about to see are extremely graphic. Um, so it might be hard to feel uh, a familiarity with the people in the photos because they depict such gruesome um, and horrible torture and death. But I have to remind everyone that these are people just like you and me. So when I'm looking at the photos, I see my two sons, six and 10 years old, my husband, and also myself. Um, because we're all humans and we have the responsibility to stand up and protect each other, despite which country we come from or which faith we believe in. So I hope that together we can face uh, this terrible truth um, that the people in the photos are telling us and work towards that such atrocities will not be tolerated in any time of history or in any society in the world. Yeah, so I think we can end the stream and I will give you some information about practicalities when we go down. So thank you very much for looking.